So we are with the background of Fatima. Month of May, Flores de Mayo. A bit cloudy there. How oh, I wish the spring. <laughs> Uh, so regarding this uh, commandment, I don't know if there is a PowerPoint there. That's how I summarize the gospel. It's about the commandment of love. It's in John 15, what we heard, starting in the verse 9, and it will go until verse 17. And, well, the commandment of love. Uh, regarding this commandment that we have listened in the gospel, it is also clear that other gospels, if we want to become critical about it, there are questions that we may ask. I don't know if when you listen to the gospel, you just receive it as, in a way, a critical, no, no questions, or you just receive it as it is, like it or not. So I invite you this morning that all the words that the gospel tells us, we also can make questions. And for example, here there are two questions. When it, it comes to reflect about the love of God or the commandment to love that we could ask. In other gospel, not the one of John, in another one's uh, Matthew, Mark, the, the commandment will appear like this. What is the first commandment? Love God with all your heart, your, your mind and strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself. And the commandment of love could have these two resistances. I don't know if you thought of them already. Can we love God? without seeing him, wouldn't it be much easier to love someone we see? And then the other one is, can love be commanded? Because if it has to be free, how can someone command me to love? So the commandments that we learned in the catechesis when we were young, in the moral teachings of the church, in the capitalism, we listen from the church, at least in my way of receiving it, it should go through a critical filter. Actually, any word of God, I think it's good to, that we receive it, if I, you have listened about the Lala, in when we talk about prayer, listening, assimilating, uh, living out and announcing, la la. So the listening is okay. When we read, we are, the Vatican second says, we listen to God when we read his words. So the listening is when we read, we are listening to the word. But then the assimilation for today, I was thinking maybe this is what simulation is all about because myself, I sometimes have some difficulty to understand what is this la la. What, where to draw the line? What is assimilating and leaving it out? Where does one start and the other one? I really sometimes am, I am confused. What does it mean to assimilate the word of God? What does it mean? If you know, you can explain. <laughs> I give you the, because assimilate the word of God, to assimilate, what does it mean? And, and when I was preparing these guidelines, this reflection, I, I had the impression, I, it was my first time to think about it, that perhaps assimilating the word of God is to, to be honest and to, to show or to take from us the resistances that we have for certain words or for certain commandments that we not deeply agree with it or it does not sound good to our ears. 
I, so I hope not to be scandalizing you. Just, um, but there are some. No, for example, in this gospel that we have learned, when I I read Jesus saying, "You are my friends if you do what I command you," it does not sound good. Did you say this to your friends? I am your friend if you do what I command you. It sounds a bit authoritarian. It sounds a bit, I don't know. Or for example, you know, when I was studying theology in Loeches, Madrid, we had a teacher, he, by the way, at the time, he was also our superior, and he gave us classes of theology. And he gave us classes of dogma. Dogma, let us say, temario, or the, the truth of faith. Now, God, or dogma, no? Jesus is God, Jesus is man. So he's in everything equal to us, you know? He's like, except for sin, so we go off. So he's not like us. <laughs> there are... And we have this kind of resistance many times. You know? we, we listen to the theology, we listen to the truth of faith, but there are certain things that we really don't understand or it makes noise. So if he's, if he's in all the things like us, except for sin, can he really be a model for me? Because I'm a sinner and he does not have sin. So, and all these things, I'm not going to enter into it now today in this particular topic, but what I'm trying to talk is about the methodology. We should not silence uh, the questions we have and the doubts we have and the things that apparently are not uh, so easy to digest. And that's why I remember this, our teacher, after giving us a class of whatever topic, then he would give another class with the name. I don't know if the English translation is very good, but it would be something like cracks, fissures. You know, when a container has a crack, fissure does not contain all the water. It's there are leaks, and in the end, you don't you don't have the whole water. And he put the class, which the name was Fisher. So I, I give you the topic, like imagine I give you one topic about theology, and then the next class will be what doesn't what is difficult for you to accept? What what is really uh, not easy to accept? Um, bring all your fissures, you no, know, your your cracks uh, that make not make not easy to assimilate. So these are two here for the commandment of love. One is, and these fissures or this um, against or this uh, resistance to the commandment of love are here and they don't come from me. So I'm safe. They come from Pope Benedict. <laughs> so I'm safe. Uh, it's in his uh, Deus Caritas S. It's an encyclica, and he's the one helping us to reflect, and he comes up with these two questions. No one has ever seen God. So how could we love him? This is in the Bible. No one has ever seen God. How can we love him? And the second question is, Love cannot be a commandment. It is ultimately a feeling that is either there or not. It cannot be produced by will. This is also maybe in our minds. I mean, uh, how can you command someone to love if someone does not want, he will not, not be forced to it. So this is what for me in prayer is assimilation. How can we answer to these questions? So Pope Benedict also says in his reflection, well, it is true. Nobody 
has seen God. And yet, God is not totally invisible. He does not remain completely invisible. And this is also true. It's true that somewhere in the, in the first letter of John and in the gospel of John, especially John 1, 18, it says there, nobody has ever seen God. But the truth on the commandment of love are this. God loved us first. And his love appeared among us. For example, and I invite you to think of it today, all the creation. For example, the sunrise, the waking up, the beautiful landscapes. And we are only talking about the planet Earth. Let's not even talk about the universe and the beauty of so many things that uh, through them, God is somehow visible. It is visible to our eyes. The blue skies, the, the sea, the ocean, so many things that God has created. And in that way, he is not totally invisible. He appeared among us. He has been visible in as much as he has sent his only son into the world. This is one step more. First the creation and then himself was made flesh and he revealed himself in the person of Jesus. So it's true. God himself, maybe we have never seen him, but it's true also that he came to us in his son, Jesus. God has made his son visible in different ways. And here are the different ways in which God has made his son visible. For example, as we were saying, in Jesus, then he comes to us, he seeks us. He tries to win our hearts through his passion. You remember, for example, the Holy Week in Tagalog, Mahal Naaro. It's really someone trying to uh, seduce our hearts through what he went through in his passion. And here are some pictures of the cross of Magellan <laughs> in the in the Santo Niño's Basilica. I was there recently, then celebrated Mass. And, you know, really, if we think back, how many ways through which God made himself visible to you? Think about creation. Think about your parents. Think about your relatives. Think about important teachers that you had in your life. Think about so many people through whom God really uh, reached you. Think about all the missioneros, missioneras, not only from Verbunde, but how many missioneros, missioneras uh, came to this country, uh, gave their best also many with many mistakes, with many wrongdoings also. But in the end, we have faith because there were people who came and left their own countries and left their own families and left their own zone, uh, comfort zone and came here to reach out and to give the gospel. So this is how we decide to see these signs. We can just sign out. Oh, these are very mabait, no, missionary. But we can also see this is God making himself visible through the life of so many people. No? And then not to say the Eucharist, the sacraments, the liturgy. In that way, God makes himself visible. Human strings, friendship, you know, human strings. Uh, and then he saved us so many times. So God has made uh, his son visible in different ways. So this is uh, in short, 
we if we perceive his presence and therefore we learn to recognize his presence in our daily lives he has loved us first and continues to do so we too then can respond with love and this is what is all about he loves us and he makes us see and experience his love and since he loved us first love can also blossom or can also grow from within as a response and this is what one of the things that i really would like to share to you this morning because it's much different that the love to god is like the result of an imposed commandment that we have learned in the catechesis you have to you must it's totally different the commandment of love in like a, a moral imperative that we know that we have to do it like it or not is completely different of uh, loving god coming from within as a response and this is i think what we can get from prayer because in prayer we have the first step which is listening what he says and then the second step is assimilating in this exercise of assimilating the word of god is where we have this fruit that the love the commandment of love is not imposed to us like an imperative a moralistic in, imperative it's coming from within why because i was able to observe i was able to contemplate i was able to be aware i was able to acknowledge that god loved me first and that's maybe one of the reasons when jesus gives this commandment in the gospel he says I uh, love uh, as the father loved me I have loved you meaning to say if in the life of Jesus was not that acknowledgement first how the father loved him probably he would not have been able to love us as he did because what he says is I have loved you as the father has loved me so if we don't go through this process of acknowledging how the father loves us uh, the love to others the love one another might be very uh, weak or very small it, it is i think it is proportional what we acknowledge that the love the father to us and what we love others maybe has a direct proportion i don't know god does not demand us a feeling which we ourselves are incapable to produce and this uh, for example in portuguese you know that to say thank you you know the word we use is obrigado some of you know which means obliged and it sounds a bit not so good no like in spanish it's gracias it's more gracia no grace like sounds more but in portuguese is obrigado and reflecting on this way of saying thanks obrigado it's something like this it's not an obligation um, like imposed is an obligation of love after seeing all the favors that you have done to me after seeing and contemplating all the gifts you have given to me i feel out of love obliged to give back so it's really uh, the word thank you the thanksgiving it's very much connected with giving love back to the one who loved us first and this for me why is it so important because it shifts us from a scenario which is only moral obligations to a free relationship with god from within from within it's not a commandment that it is imposed it comes from within after the experience of being loved 
He loves us and he makes us see and experience his love. And since he loved us first, love can also blossom. Love can also grow from within as a response. So this is the first part of the reflection. And then we move on to the second part, which I think has to do with living out. So the assimilation was what I have been sharing, that I assimilate the word so that it is not a, a heavy commandment. Like Jesus says, my heavy is my way. I know, come to me, the, all those who are burdened. He was talking to the Pharisees who took the law of God as something very heavy. The, he was talking to those people who, for them, the word of God and the law of God and the commandments were very heavy. And he says, uh, my, I you know, is it? My yoke is easy. Woke is a reference to the word of God and to the law. My woke is easy. My burden is light. Like, like Jesus telling them, for you it is very heavy. Commandments, the Ten Commandments. How can, and then Jesus said, the same commandments for me are easy and light because he assimilated it through this process of as the Father loved me, I have loved you. So I don't know this picture, but I uh, know it. Uh, <laughs> because in this gradual unfolding of the encounter with God, it is clearly revealed that love is not a merely, it's not merely a sentiment. Love is not only a feeling. There is a song uh, that goes like this. You know, I don't trust my inner feelings. Inner feelings come and go. So many times in this society, we just reduce love to what is a feeling. And I don't know in English, but in Spanish, there is this, and in Portuguese as well, expression, my compañero sentimental. You know, my, my sentimental partner. And then I, I heard from one married couple of our community saying, it's very logical that when we have our uh, uh, girlfriend or boyfriend or sometimes husband, but not married, but they live in, if I put this sentimental partner, it's very logical that there is a lot of change. Because the, it, they will change as sentiments and feelings change, not sentiment. So love is something more than a feeling, than a spark. And here, the Pope Benedict, in his reflection, it also said that a sentiment, a feeling, can be a marvelous spark. But it is not the fullness of love. There is a process of purification. There is a process of maturity. And so again, back to the title, Commandment of Love, we also, we also observe that it's a process. And I think this applies for couples. This applies for religious, for those of us who have vows. And this applies for the relationship with God. At the beginning, it might start with a feeling. Some, sometimes even chemistry. <laughs> there is chemistry between these two people. There is a natural attraction. There is a good feeling. And that's what starts the whole story of love. No? And, and God uh, does not uh, want to take it away from us, this part that starts. But then it has to go through a purification. And at the beginning, all of us are blind. <laughs> Love is blind. Uh, and, you know, even Madre Teresa said that. She said that she embraced her life with such a, 
uh, an enthusiasm when she was a young religious sister. And then she said, if I only knew what I would go through, she said, I would not have said yes to God. That she, that's what she said. If in the moment that I was a young religious woman and I said yes in the moment of my profession, the perpetual vow, and I was, my heart is in, on fire. If I only knew all the tribulations, all the difficulties, all the crosses, all that I would have in the future, I would have said no. But in the moment I said yes, I was so enthusiastic. And I think it applies also, I don't know, I was never married, but at the beginning there is this part that blinds us. <laughs> and then it's not life, it's not always that spark, that enthusiasm, but it does not mean that love is not there, but it has to be purified and changed and grow mature and not depending on feelings or on sentiment. And, and the missionary life and, and the, I think it's a human, this is a very a, a human experience. So we, we, we should not uh, in, be naive and think that with God, our relationship or our love to our neighbors and our love to God would always be motivated by a feeling. Some, there is a time who has to, we have to give one more step. That love also affects our will and our intellect. And this is very important. Mature mean, mature love means to engage all our potentialities, our whole person, so to speak. Not only the spark that was there at the beginning. The contact with the visible manifestations of the love of God can awake us, awake in us, a feeling of joy. This is when, you know, when we have a contact with a visible manifestation of the love of God, this can awake us, awake in us, a feeling of joy, born of the experience of being loved. But this encounter also engages our will and intelligence. And this is so important because many times to love one another needs a decision. It's not only I feel like, like in the moment, in the day of the wedding, <laughs> or in the day, I feel like. But there are, in then, there are many moments I don't feel like, but we still can decide to love. It's a decision. And when I say intellect, is also the project, the future. So I, I think this is where in the Lala, the living out is about the decision, the will. Acknowledging the living God is one path towards love. And the yes of our will to his will unites intellect, unites will and the sentiments in the all embracing act of love. So it's it, it's really a process. And, and I think sometimes we, if we don't do this decision, that's why instead of love in the couples, no? in the marriage life, I have seen many times that the love one another becomes love another one <laughs> because if we are just uh i mean if you are just mm, guided by your feelings or just guided by your instinct you don't have to make decisions you don't have to decide the, the ones who their choice of life is only following the instinct 
following the feelings, the chemistry, and it's part of us, the chemistry, the feelings, is part of the human being, but it's not the only one. It's not the only one. Human being also has will, and human beings also have intellect. So when we say love one another, has to be also engaging our will and, and engaging our intellect, engaging our project. What is my project with God? What is my project with my family? Because this is part of it. In other words, one becomes similar to the other, and this leads to a communion of love. And again, uh, in the using the Portuguese language or the Spanish language, and I think in English as well, when you love someone, you say, I love you. But sometimes in, in Spanish, we can say, te quiero, I want you. I want you. It's also a decision. I love you. I want you. Te quiero. Uh, and and, and that, these are different expressions, but the language sometimes talks about the reality. And in this case, the reality is that I also make a decision to love this person, to love my family, although I don't feel like always doing it. I don't feel like, but I want. That is my decision. So with God is the same. There are moments where we are more inspired and there are moments where our prayer flows. There are moments we are very added. There is really dryness. There are moments there is no will. There is, but the commandment of love should entail all these things. Not only when I feel, but it should also entail what do I want to do? What did I decide to do as a project of life? And this is uh, important. Some happens between God and human, the same happens between God and human beings. God's will became becomes our own will, not imposed from outside. And that's why some saints have said, I think it's in the next slide, uh, defining what love is, some saints have said, to want the same thing, and to reject the same thing. It's, uh, well, I don't know if this is 100% the truth of faith, but that was what some things said about love. And they were referring to God, to want the same thing. So the will of God becomes mine. And actually, Jesus, when he was praying in Gethsemane, that's what he said. I don't want this. Father, if it is possible, away from me, this chalice, I don't want, but let your will be done. So he made the will of God his own will. He assimilated and then he decided. And I think this is the process. Listen, assimilate, and live out, living out. Decide. And well... I think this has a lot of uh, I know, experiences and content that you yourselves you can uh, share. And the last part, third part, final part, it's very simple. Now, based on this, on what we have seen, uh, that is how we can reach to love someone whom we don't like or even we don't know. If we are not only based on feelings and we have this communion with the feelings of God, the will of God, the thoughts of God, that's how we can reach this situation of being able to love someone whom we don't like or whom we don't even know. This can only happen in the basis of communion with God. Communion with his will, with his affectivity, with his sentiments, and with his mind. When we look at someone, we look at him or we look at her 
in the perspective of God with his own thoughts. And this is so important because even Jaime, our founder, used to say this, no, maybe he was having a hard time with us or with Makulit <laughs> missioneros or missioneras, I don't know. I think Jaime also had a hard time when he had to guide uh, this international community with people of all kinds. And he, he shared many times that when he was losing his patience or when he was already becoming judgmental or when his exercise was always, or, or, or when he thought this person should not be a missionero in his criteria, no? Or a missionera. He had all these kind of thoughts sometimes. <laughs> I will forgive me if I don't ask him. <laughs> if you will wake up now in Setiaguas, you will come. Again. But uh, he knows I, I am right. I mean, I am telling the truth. <laughs> but he also shared what he did. No, He, he tried to look at this missionary or to read missionary with the eyes of Jesus. He said, uh, I did not choose him. You have chosen. And he said, he is your children. He is, he is your beloved. So it's give one more step to love someone whom we don't like really the way is to be in communion with God and look at the person from the perspective of Jesus. Who is he for him? For me, this person is unbearable. But then ask in your prayer, how do you see this person, Jesus or beloved father? How do you see this person? And Jesus would say, he's my, he's my child or he's my friend or he's my uh, chosen one. So in this communion with God, only in that in situation, I think it is possible to love someone you don't like uh, and, and really be transformed if we make uh, God's thoughts and God's perspective our own perspective. And this happened a lot among the disciples, I think. Uh, if you have watched some episodes of The Chosen, we can see how the disciples among themselves, there are some of them that cannot bear each other. They are like politic enemies. They have, they have economic issues. They have envy. They have their own fights. And the only way to, to give steps and not be stuck there is really to look each one of them with the perspective of Jesus. When we look at someone, like here now, I learn to look on his other person, not simply with my eyes or feelings, but from the perspective of Jesus. His friends are my friends. I can go beyond exterior appearances and I can perceive in others an interior desire for a sign of love, of concern. Maybe the next slide yeah we always need to to balance no but what i want to say with this image there i can see someone from my perspective he's just a beggar he's just someone who is bothering me but i if i look at him with the eyes of the father with the eyes of jesus maybe it's totally different i see someone there a child of God there. And my feelings, my actions will be totally different depending on how I see this person. What's the perspective, my perspective of this person? It can be someone else or it can be an image of God, a temple of God. So it's really important. And where do we get this perspective in our prayer? When we try to be in communion with the thoughts, with the sentiments, with the feelings, and with the will 
of God. I can offer this to them not only through organizations in NGOs intended for such purposes, accepting it as a political necessity. When I look at people who are in great need, I can reach them out in a way like politicians uh, in, in a good sense, reach out poverty, they try to, to have organizations, distribution of food, uh, to improve the medical care. This can be done also through politics and it's very welcoming, it's very good. But if we are Christians in that sense that we have the mind of Christ, the will of Christ, the thoughts of Christ, the feelings of Christ, we can go beyond an institution. We can go beyond what an or a good organization can do. Why? Because we can uh, sing others with the love of Christ. I can offer them much more than their outward necessities. I can give them the look of love which they crave. I can give them time because they need to be listened. And this is sometimes this is really a touch that in this world, not all organizations, and they can give a lot of food and they can give a lot of material things, which is again a blessing of God which is a, a, a true blessing of God. But in, in the Christian life, we can also go beyond it, giving things that are not material. For example, time for people to be listened. There are so many problems. There are so many invisible problems and in the youth and in the adults. And I, I tell you, listening to people is really charity. In our days, it's really, there are so many people alone. And this is what also Pope Benedict said, the new forms of poverty is loneliness. Alone and loneliness is sometimes people are alone, they are not lonely. <laughs> but they are, sometimes the two things go together. So conclusion, no conclusion. We always need to balance the love of God and the love to the neighbor. If I don't have any contact with God, I will see others as just another person. One more. I will be incapable of seeing in him or in her someone as an image of God. If I don't have any contact with God, I can do many things, but I will never have this perspective that this person is a temple of God. This person is a child of God. But if in my life I totally ignore and snob others, just because I have the desire to be devout and perform my religious duties, then my relationship with God will also grow at it. It becomes merely proper. My relation with God is proper, but loveless. So there are two extremes. Those people who, who are in a real activism and they don't care about the relationship with God and they become only activists, <laughs> activism. But the other extreme are those people who snub others. They don't, I mean, they, uh, they are so religious, so religious, and their relationship with God is, is legal, no? Unregular. Uh, it's like, I'm uh, well married in the church. My kids are all baptized. My, I don't have any illegal thing, no? Because the others, maybe they are divorced. I'm totally 100% legal. But if I don't, if in that situation, in a very legal situation, 
you you snob others. You don't care about your relationship with God is just properties, but loveless. So this is the balance you know, for me that we are talking about when we say commandment of love. Only my readiness to encounter my neighbor and to show him or her love makes me sensitive to God. Only if I serve my neighbor can my eyes be open to what God does for me and how much he loves me. Because if, if you set yourself in a path of loving your neighbor, it's automatic that your, your heart is more sensitive, sensitive to God as well. And then your prayer will flow. So this really goes together. The love to God, the love to the neighbor go together. And this is, uh, I think, very well phrased by Jesus when he said, as the Father loved me, I have loved you. So this is it. I don't know if there is any other slide. I think that's it. Maybe the questions will be there. Madam question. So now the questions are three. Yeah, so the first one is about assimilation. What is the easiest part and the most difficult part to assimilate from the gospel or from uh, one of the other readings? For me, it was like when Jesus said, uh, you are my friends if you do what I command. It does not sound good. So. <laughs> How can you explain this? No, but choose your own part. What is the easiest and the most difficult part to assimilate? Second question is how are prayer and loving others related in your life? Does one imply the other? Or you just pray? Or you just have charity? So how are they related in your life? And the third one is can you give an example? Could be from another person, but or could be also from your own experience. Can you give an example or one experience of mature love that does not remain in the feelings because it goes beyond the feelings? Can you share about it? Maybe it could be someone that you have seen that has a mature love or it could also be your own experience that you can share. So this is it. Thank you so much and have a nice, nice time of prayer now.